Part 2. Chapter 17. Theopathy and Phrenopathy, or the union of the divine and human in the cure of disease. The doctrine of a healing power of thought, discussed in the preceding chapter, is based on the Hegelian principle that thought is a creative force. The fundamental idea of Hegel's philosophy is that everything in its last analysis, or when we come to its inmost reality, is only a thought. What we call the external world and the human body, which is a part of it, are the thought of God, and we come to know them only so far as we think of them. They are revealed to us by the same power that creates them. Disease, like every other thing, is created, or at least, has an existence only by thought. In the phrenopathic or mental method of cure, it is a fundamental principle that thought is the ground of all reality. The words real and reality come from the Latin res, which is an exact equivalent of our word thing, and means that which is an object of thought. This is recognized in the Hebrew, where the term for word means also thing, as a word is only an express thought. That which is out of thought has to us no conscious existence, for consciousness is only a mode of thought. A thing, a world, a disease, comes into our consciousness only when we think of it. To be unconscious of a thing is all the same as if it were not. To bring disease into the realm of unconsciousness is to make it unreal, or in other words, to cure it, for to be diseased and not know it, or think of it, or be conscious of it, is equivalent to being without disease. In disease we feel weak. This is implied by the terms that are used to express it in all languages. All maladies are called infirmities, or weaknesses. The same want of force or vigor is implied when we call the sick person an invalid, from in, not, and strong. Feebleness is a fundamental idea of a diseased condition, and the woman healed by Jesus is a representative of this aspect of disease. She was bowed down with a spirit of infirmity for eighteen years, where we do well to mark the Hebraism in the use of a genitive for an adjective. An infirm spirit was the root of the malady. In this enfeebled state of the will and of the power of thought to enter into a combat with disease and our unassisted strength seems like an effort to lift a mountain from its base. Is there any help that is always available and effectual? Can we come into union with the everywhere present power that creates and governs the universe and join our weakness to the divine omnipotence in our curative effort? There is in our nature a psychometrical or sympathetic sense the higher use of which is communion with God and all higher intelligences. By means of this, in a perfectly natural way, we may be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. We have seen in what precedes the wonderful power of thought over the bodily organism, but our thought may be reinforced by an alliance with the infinite mind. God created and still creates the world and all that is in it by thought. We can so come into direct and immediate communication with him that his creative energy shall be added to our cogitative and volitional power, so that there shall be a confluence of the two into a unity and harmony. Where is God, and how may I find him? We look for him in the distance, and thus miss him, says the astronomer Lalande. I have swept space with my telescope and found no God, and simply because he did not look for him where alone the soul can find him. We do not discover God as we do a new planet in the heavens. He is revealed to us in the New Testament, and demonstrated by the intuitive reason, as a spirit, and a spirit is to be found and known by thought only, and not to be seen by the sensuous eye of the body. Jesus the Christ introduced into the thought of the world two important ideas. 1. That God is our Father, and that consequently we are His sons. This implies that we derive our life perpetually from Him, and live in Him. There is in us an unbroken and ceaseless vital connection with Him. 2. God is inward to man. Before this grand disclosure, He was worshipped and adored, and sought unto as an indefinable being, and at an obscure, if not unlimited, distance from men. Jesus taught us where to find Him. We are to seek Him within the enclosure of our own being. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. We no longer seek the thoughts of God from external signs, or from outward oracles, as that of Delphi, or the Urim and Thummim of the Jews. Paul, in an inspired moment, gave utterance to one of the profoundest truths in the universe of mind, the grandest verity within the compass of human thought. In him we live and are moved and have our being. As certainly as the unborn infant's life is that of the mother, 
So it is divinely true that somehow God's life includes ours, and we live because He lives, and shall live as long as He exists. Our being is comprised in His, so that if we could suppose the divine life to come to an end, ours would terminate with it as surely, to compare great things with small, as a stream would cease to flow when its fountain is dried up. My existence may be distinct, but never separate from His. In the hidden depth of the soul there is somewhere a point where our individual being comes in contact with God and is identified with the infinite life, as a bay meets the ocean. This great truth may not now cross the threshold or door sill of our consciousness, but we may nevertheless be as certain of it as we are of the divine existence or of our own. Swedenborg calls this deific point, where God and man meet within the soul, the divine internal, and the entrance of God into man, and affirms that it is by virtue of it that we live at all and live forever. Arcana Celestia, 1999 When we cease to think of ourselves as separated from God, and come to view our being as comprised in His, as a bay, however far inland it may extend, is not disconnected from the ocean, then we kindle anew the smoking wick of our candle of life from a divine and quenchless flame. When we see this truth in disease, in pain, in unhappiness, the incoming tide of the ocean of the divine existence flows back into the river of our life, fills its banks to the full, turns its current in another direction towards the uplands of health and blessedness, and causes it to overflow to others. A largo proportion of diseases are of a so-called nervous type, or in other words, are purely mental. It is an uneasy or dissatisfied state, as the word signifies, or perhaps there is a combination of more or less painful sensations, or a functional disturbance of one or more organs. All these conditions are under the control of the power of thought. But how is it in cases of organic disease, or when there is an actual lesion or loss of continuity in an organ? In this case, the mental state that acts as a cause is more fixed and harder of removal. But to put the trouble, whatever it is, out of thought, to forget it, to ignore it, to think of something else, to institute a line of thought that is inconsistent with it, and to think in harmony with the unconscious effort of what we call nature to repair the lesion, is the best prescription for it. There is such a thing as a soul in nature, an intelligent life operating everywhere, in the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms. The old doctrine of an animus mundi is not without some foundation in reality. There is an intelligent principle recognizable by its constant action in every part and particle of the universe, in the grain of sand, in the flower, and in the stellar orbs. Nature is not unintelligent, as Spinoza taught. There is an infinite current of living thought that runs through the whole of it. The numerous marks of design, the skillful adaptation of means to an end, which we see everywhere and in everything, indicate with logical certainty the continual presence and action of intelligent thought. This is not the mind of man, but must be the over-soul, the universal mind, the absolute thought. There is a divinely intelligent force at work in the human body. It seems to be the same intelligent soul principle, the identical God power, that ceaselessly operates in the world at large. When we receive an injury or a wound, this benevolent and intelligently active principle goes to work in the most skillful and artistic manner to repair the damage. This reconstructive force of nature, which is only a gleam of the operation of God's omnipotent life in man, is the only remedy that can heal or relieve the injury, heal, if it comes within the range of possibility, and, if not, alleviate the suffering. The soul principle in us, especially in the preconscious range of its action, has a close relationship to the soul and nature, and we can assist and greatly accelerate its curative action by thinking in concert with it. This intelligent principle in nature always acts unerringly in the right direction. Our thoughts, our faith, our fancy, our remedies, can only be tributary and auxiliary to it. If our thoughts form an alliance with it, and their force is augmented by it, the most inveterate diseases yield to the combined therapeutic power of the finite and infinite mind. This is something of God in man. It is the same power that creates and governs the world. It is the logos, the divine intelligence and thought, of which nature is a permanent expression. God's thoughts are always in the direction of our highest good, the healing of our diseases and the removal of the causes of our unhappiness. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, 
thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. In other words, God's creative thought always cooperates with ours in every curative endeavor of our minds to cause us to realize the end at which we aim. An act of faith in this divinely intelligent, creative, and repairing power places the plastic action of our minds in alliance with it. We enter into a co-partnership, a fellowship, a sympathy, a community with it, and the cure is at the same time phrenopathic and theopathic. It is a confluence of our thought and our imagination in their volitional healing effort with the force that created and ever creates our bodies and the world in which they dwell. It places the soul principle in us in apposition and conjunction with the creative word and the plastic spirit. This has not retired from nature, but is still there as an intelligent conatus to heal all our diseases, though its silent action in the human body does not come within the grasp of consciousness. That which created the world and our bodies is never absent from them. For, as Bishop Sherlock demonstrated, preservation is a continued creation. To find the divine life and power in their manifestation as a creative force, we need not go to the temple of worship, much less back through all the ages of human history to a time when the solitary deity was seized with an impulse to make a world out of nothing. For it is nearer to us than the world on which we tread, because it is the hidden spring of every physiological movement. It is the secret and mysterious virtue of every medicine or curative device. When, by an act of faith and imagination, I think in the same direction, and in concert with this intelligent and divine conatus, to repair my injury, to heal my wounds, or to cure my disease, and no longer by my thought obstruct its therapeutic and saving effort in my behalf, its action is intensified and accelerated. As one has said, there is surely a piece of the divinity in us, something that was before the elements and owes no homage to the sun. Nature tells me I am the image of God, as well as Scripture. He that understands not this much hath not his introduction or first lesson, and is yet to begin the alphabet of man. There is more than a spark of the divinity in us, and this life of God in man has more to do with our restoration from disease than even religious people ever dream of, though it is a clearly taught doctrine of the Jewish sacred writings that it is God who heals all our diseases. Cure by any of the prevailing methods is, in its inmost nature, a theopathy. It is always the divine in nature and in man that heals. As we have shown, there is a wonderful repairing force inherent in our organism. In some of the lower forms of animal life, it is still more manifest than in man, as a segment of a limb is sometimes replaced by it. Hartmann calls it the action of the unconscious, by which he means a sort of blind impersonal intelligence and will that govern the world. I see no good reason why we should not call it God, or, if you prefer it, the Logos or Word of God. With this modification of the meaning of the term, which takes it from what seems to border closely upon atheism and brings it into harmony with a Christian theism, I can adopt his language when he says, After poisoning their patients with drugs, the doctors have come at last to know their business better and now generally stand aside or attempt only to remove obstacles which ignorance or accident have put in the way, so as to leave free course to the curative agencies of the unconscious which alone can restore the patient to perfect health. What we call nature, a term introduced into philosophy by Hippocrates, is only the deity under another name. God's uniform mode of acting is what we call the laws of nature. Because a thing takes place in harmony with law does not exclude the idea of a divine causation from it. God is not included in the world, nor excluded from it. The visible universe is in God, just as an imaginary scene of beauty though it seems to have an external existence, is really in our minds. Nature without God would be as powerless as a body without a soul. There is not a point or particle of the globe that is isolated from him. He did not roll up the vast orbs that compose the universe and toss them away from himself like balls into empty space. He did not once, in a week of creative energy, make a world and then retire from it. Creation is not a historic fact, but an ever-present reality a thing he is perpetually doing. Man, including a soul and its manifestation in a body, is not something that has been dropped out of the divine existence as a pebble falls out of your hand, or a coin from the mint, and after that has no connection with it. We are still in him and he in us. He did not make a world or a human body 
and wind it up as you do a watch and leave it to run down without him. He winds it up continually and without a moment's intermission and is ever the hidden spring of all its movements the force that created is never inoperative. God is neither an idle spectator of his universe nor a useless appendage to it. He has not loft the world and the human body, which is a part of it, to develop themselves without his presence and interference, or, as Goethe somewhere ridicules this common belief, he does not sit aloft seeing the world go. It is neither hard to find God nor difficult to commune with him. The cumbersome and bungling machinery of the church, invented to elevate us to him, or bring him down to us, is of no use to the spiritual man. He is as near to us as we are to ourselves. His being in its infinite and endless compass includes ours. In us he somehow comes to a self-limitation. We have being in him, and he existence in us. He becomes man, and we become his gods. Jesus approved the use of this appellation in its application to human beings, as where, in the Old Testament scriptures, we read, I have said ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. It is a sublime truth that gives dignity to human nature that in us God is manifested in the flesh. To realize this in some degree of the intenseness with which Jesus the Christ was perceptive of it is to be conscious of a power that we otherwise cannot possess. In us also the Word is made flesh and still dwells among us, for it is our life, and that life is the light of men. It is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. In saying this we do not undeify the Christ, but elevate human nature at large. In common language we call a priest or clergyman a divine I affirm that other men are equally entitled to the appellation. The Word of God is not a person, much less a book, but the perpetual outgoing and expression of his productive and enlightening thought. This Word dwells in every man as the light of life, and invests us with a creative potency, for all things are made by it. It is God's thought, and when our minds are in unison with it in our struggle with disease, we are invested with a fraction of God's omnipotence. Here is realized a theocrasia, as it was called in ancient philosophy, a mixing with God. When we thus act, the boundary line between our individual effort and God's creative energy is obliterated, and they become merged into a unity, as when a child and a strong man lift a rock from its place. The strength of the two is mingled into one force. Jesus, who became in so high a degree receptive of the illuminating and creative word, which made him the Christ, did not look upon his own being as separated from that of the Father, but as included in it. Believe me, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. The secret of the cures and all the marvelous works of Jesus is given by himself in John 5 verses 19 and 20, 30. He declares that it was given him distinctly to see and clearly to recognize the divine operation in nature. In disease he saw a divine power, a vis reparatrix at work to cure it. He identified himself with God and cooperated with this divine healing conatus in the human body, and thus greatly intensified its therapeutic action. In raising the patient from disease to health, he lifted in the same direction and in concert with God. He plainly asseverates that Ho did nothing of himself, but only what he saw the Father doing. Why may not a sincere disciple of Jesus become in this a copy of the Master and do the same? By acting in unison with the divine power in nature, which is perceived already at work in the case, we may be empowered to restore the sufferer to his normal state, a sound mind in A. Sound body. This is effected not by a miracle, but, as in the case of the cures wrought by Jesus, by an accelerated process of nature. All the wonderful achievements of modem science and the useful arts, as telegraphy, photography, and the 10,000 results of machinery, are effected in the same way. In all human endeavor, conformity to nature is union with God. But there is a higher realm of nature than that whose laws we generally recognize in our superficial sciences and shallow philosophies, an almost unexplored region of law in relation to the action of spirit on matter and of the soul upon its body. If, in the effort to cure disease, I can find out how God is doing it and conform my healing endeavor to the divine method, I come into line with him and march behind the veiled Godhead to the desired result.
I can conform my effort to the divine creative thought here, as I can act in concert with the divine law of gravitation in bringing the water of a spring on the mountainside into my habitation. In either case I do nothing of myself, but only what I see the Father doing. There is an interior gravitation of all souls towards God, their proper center. The wandering soul, disguise it as it may, is homesick for its native land and for rest on the besom of the infinite love, conscious union with the one life, and an identification of our being with the only reality is the goal toward which we are running. These soul longings are not only worship but an unerring prophecy of what we are to be. We are all on the route that leads to God where all life begins, and in which it should forever consciously act. The brooklet that rushes down the mountainside, sometimes by a fall, then in a calm and tranquil flow, is unceasingly on its way to the ocean. So the soul of man came from God and is returning to him, but so as to retain forever the freedom of its individuality in God. The soul that longs for communion with God need not search long to find him. Accustom yourself, says Madame Guyon to seek God within, and you will find Him. There is a life within us, a living force and intelligent thought, that pervade the bodily organism. It is the soul of our soul, the life of our life, the spring of all our knowledge. As Bishop Berkeley puts it, there is a mind that affects me every moment with all the sensible impressions I perceive, and, from the variety, order, and manner of these, I conclude the author of them to be wise, powerful, and good beyond comprehension. The things perceived by me are known by the understanding and produced by the will of an infinite spirit. And is not all this most plain and evident? Is there any more in it than what a little observation in our own minds, and that which passes in them, not only enable, h us to conceive, but also oblige us to acknowledge? This brings God very near to us. This universal mind and spirit, in which is included all knowledge, all truth, all life, and all blessedness, perpetually acts within us. It thinks for us when we cannot think for ourselves. It works in us to will and to do when our individual wills are powerless or quiescent. When we cease to row, we float in the finite current and always unerringly in the right direction. When we cease from our own working, we do the will of God, or in other words, God's will works for us and in us. The greatest possible attainment the summit of our highest aspirations, is the conscious identification of our individual life with the one life. Our unhappiness, our misery, our restless craving for an unrealized good, our unsatisfied yearning, and our disease, arise from our seceding from the universal life, disjoining ourselves from it by the rebellion of what we proudly call free will, and setting up for ourselves. If we would leave the strings of our harp to vibrate from sympathy with the music of the universe, Instead of fingering them ourselves and trying to play a different tune or on a different and discordant key, we should be happy and well. He who attains to the blessedness of a life in God, as did Jesus the Christ, lives well and forever. His spiritual stature reaches from earth to the heavens. He has mounted upward to immortality in this present time and lives eternal life on the earth. Disease and death are vanquished, and his individuality is merged without being destroyed, in the all-comprehending life. In consequence of this indwelling of God, the common life of the universe, in us, recuperation is natural to the human body and to all living things. There is a divine energy inherent in the system that immediately and with omniscient skill reacts against every disorder of mind or body and exhibits itself in a psychical and physiological effort to restore harmony. When a crumb of bread enters the trachea or windpipe, with what divine violence all the muscles that expel the air from the lungs contract to blow it out. This spasmodic action of the abdominal muscles and the diaphragm is not a disease, but is a curative effort of the organism to cast out a foreign and deleterious substance from the lungs. When a speck of dust or a grain of sand enters the eye, the lacrimal glands are stimulated to increased action, and the eye is suffused with a flood of tears to wash it out. In the case of poison or unwholesome food in the stomach, the first effort of the divine life, or what we call nature, is to induce nausea and vomiting. The action of the stomach is inverted so as to eject its injurious contents at once. If this does not succeed, 
The next resort of the divine healing energy is to increase the peristaltic action and vermicular movement of the stomach and intestinal canal, so as to rid the system of it as soon as possible by a diuretic discharge. No mother's love, enlightened by all that medical science can give, could prescribe with such alacrity and skill as does nature, that is, the God life in us, in this and all other emergencies. In the case of all wounds and lesions, from the prick of a pin to the fracture of a limb, a curative effort of nature, by which can be meant only a divine energy, acting according to an established order we call law, exhibits itself in a skillful endeavor to heal it. Witness the suppuration of the flesh around a splinter that has pierced the hand. The pain in a sprained ankle is, as Romberg poetically but truly expresses it, the prayer of the sensory nerves for more blood, and the divine life of nature answers the prayer by crowding the surrounding parts with blood and its swollen condition is the result. Very much that passes under the name of disease is only an effort of the divine life that is in us to cure the real malady. In the case of a sudden cold, or the pores of the skin are closed, nature throws the heat of the body to the surface, because, according to a fixed law, heat expands the contracted pores and opens them, thus restoring the suspended perspiration. The feverish condition of the body is not a disease but only a curative device of nature. Instead of checking and obstructing this healing endeavor, we should cooperate with it, and, so far as our therapeutic devices go, we should aim to accelerate its action, as did Jesus the Christ. In our individuality we are endowed with free will, and, to use a scriptural and not wholly inappropriate form of expression, we may come to the help of the Lord in His divine curative effort. How we may do this in harmony with the laws of our being it will be the object of the remaining part of this work to show.